Africa Business News, proudly sponsored by EY. Africa, it is huge, it is diverse, and its business landscape, fascinating and dynamic. And that's our business here on your favorite weekly African business stop in Nairobi. Bonnie Tunia brings us the latest from East Africa. Esther Aoyin in Lagos gives us news from West Africa. And later with me in the Johannesburg studio, we have Christine Mundo. My name is Victor Homoeswana, and this is the Africa Business News. Mambo Boni, briefly tell us about the latest from Burundi. I read a story there about a rare earth metals deal with a German company which was being criticized for its apparent support for embattled President Pierre Nkurunziza, although it was concluded sometime in May, of course. It just shows how everything is connected in the end. Well, Victor, I mean, this whole mining story and the Germans, uh, there are lots of such stories that are coming out of Burundi right now. But what we are sure of, uh, we, we can say for certain is that the worsening political situation in Burundi threatens to disrupt economic activity and the administrative stability and weaken the political uh, will and capacity to implement the much needed structural reforms in the little, little East African country. Now, the crisis has the potential to reignite long standing ethnic hostilities between the Hutus and the Tutsis and further destabilize the East African uh, region. Obviously, no one wants to see this. But the latest uh, victor is that Burundi's president has sacked three cabinet uh, ministers as protests resumed after last week's failed coup. The president's spokesman denied that the dismissal of the defense, external and trade ministers was linked to the coup attempt. However, soldiers fired uh, in the air to disperse protesters against uh, President uh, Pierre Nkuruziza running for a third term in elections due uh, next month. Also interesting victors that the sacked MPs uh, replacements have already been appointed, including Emmanuel Ntahome Vukie as the defense minister. Now, Victor, earlier on on Monday, soldiers fired five live rounds into uh, uh, into the protesters that chanted for President uh, uh, Nkuruzinza's drop uh, his bid for a third term. Obviously, no one expected resumption of protests just a day after he jetted back into the country and made his first public appearance. Uh, but obviously, a, a lot of concern about the situation in Bunjumbura, and we're hoping that this will be sorted sooner rather than later, Victor. Such a great economy doesn't need that. But I first heard the name Chris Kirubi when I spoke to the CEO of Tiger Brands a while ago. He was full of praise for the man's entrepreneurial drive. He has a lot more business interest, of course. That's what I would like you to tell us about, please, his influence on the Kenyan economy and why he's being knighted by the French now. Well, I mean, Victor, nothing spells Maverick better than Chris Kirubi. From juggling running a successful business to being an, a DJ all in one lifetime. <laughs> so it was a small affair with only the closest of friends, family and business associates in attendance as he received the insignia chevalier of the Legion of Honor signified by the red ribbon medal uh, that was pinned on his lapel. From such humble beginnings, Dr. K Chris Kirubi, uh, now the chairman of Capital uh, Group Limited, Hako Tiger Brands Limited, the International Life House, Nairobi Bottlers, DHL Kenya, and Centum Investment uh, being just among a number of notable companies that he's leading. And uh, Victor, not only is he known for his business acumen, but Dr. Kirubi joined the likes of uh, Jen Kiano, the woman rights advocate, on the list of Kenyans who have received the Legion of Honor established by the legendary N Napoleon Bonaparte in uh, 1802. And his contribution to society as a philanthropist as well and as a nationalist who served at very various national strategy, uh, I'll bet the most known one would be his uh, role in the Vision 2030 steering committee. One economy in East Africa though that we should never overlook is Ethiopia. Bonnie, great hydropower projects underway, a 700 kilometer railway project from Addis to Djibouti expected to open in 2016. Now there's another major railroad project, a 491 kilometer line joining which points this time? Well, I can tell you, Victor, joining very important points. You see, the Ethiopian Prime Minister, uh, Haile Mariam Deselen, mm. uh, just recently laid down a cornerstone at uh, Ambo Town for the construction of 491 kilometers of railway that links Addis Ababa with Bedele, known for its obviously dense natural forest and crop production in the Oromea region. Now, Victor, the project is among the eight national railway routes set uh, to be constructed by the Ethiopian Railways Corporation with a total length of get 
length is 5,060 kilometers. Uh, and noting that the government has also been spending the past five years of its growth and transformative plan, popularly known as the GTP, on the agri agricultural sector. And uh, going by its population, they obviously have a large base for whatever produce they decide to make. So really, with all intents and purposes, Ethiopia is heading in the right direction, Victor. Well, the growth and transformation program. Thank you, Bonnie Tunio, coming to us from Nairobi, Kenya. Our next stretch sees Christine Mundo joining us to talk about some of the big stories from Southern Africa. We're still with Africa Business News and in our Johannesburg studio, I'm with Christine Mundua. This past week, I got to attend the Africa Utility Week, where at the end, the MD of City Power, Stelo Klulu, received the Africa Utility Executive of the Year Award. Congratulations to him, but Christine Mundua joins me to share a few other headlines from the region. Christine, Vodacom beginning to feel the pinch of the mobile termination rate story, but it looks like the rest of the continent is offering some relief. Certainly, and I actually remember being in court uh, during that whole process when, you know, the, the network operators were in court about those regulations. And to look at the results now and see the significant impact that it's had, it's actually very astounding. Essentially, what the regulator did there was to favor the smaller players, so they're able to get more money out of it uh, than the bigger players. But as you do say, the Africa story continues to be encouraging. Um, you know, they're operating in places like Tanzania, they're in the DRC, they're in Angola. But also, it's, you know, every year we look at these results and we see how the voice rate revenues declining and all of that's going to data growth uh, and interestingly enough just a few weeks back uh, with Vodacom we were in the townships where they're building base stations because even uh, data usage in the township is growing exponentially they say that even faster than what it is growing at the national level um, and it's also partly because of those uh, cheaper devices those cheaper smartphones uh, that they've introduced to the market uh, that allow people uh, to to access data use uh, used operations like whatsapps and all of that so that story has been interesting to see and it also just reminds me of Safaricom's results uh, just the other day. Yep. Similar, uh, similar uh, trends uh, in that as well. Okay, but now tell me about Zimbabwe. Gold production taking up. What's behind that and is it sustainable? Well, here's the thing. I mean, if you look at quarter one, gold is up 25%. Uh, last year, this time, it was down about 14. So, and what we're understanding here is that the smaller players have, have contributed the majority to this. Um, but, you know, on the gold side, it's looking good. But if you then go to coal, for example, it's up 55%. But then you go to chrome, it's down 45%. And then you start to see the real story. Um, the electricity is a big problem, accounting for about 50% of costs. Um, but we do understand that there is engagement with the power utility, they're called CESA, uh, to look into that as well in terms of bringing down and negotiating those tariffs um, and we also know that the Chamber of Mines is having its 76th annual meeting uh, where they're going to be continuing to discuss uh, issues around of course beneficiation and diversification and further allowing the mining sector to contribute to the economy. Which African country doesn't have a power utility problem? Well that's Christine Mundo. Next up Esther Awin in Lagos chest to us about West Africa. As the soon Nigeria's new president will assume his duties with lots of expectations, but there's one worry General Buhari's mind will be about how to plug the hole left by the lower revenue collected so far this year. Why the drop in revenue? Well, Victor, oil prices have fallen over 50% since June last year. And as you know, Nigeria depends on the proceeds from this commodity for over 70% of its revenue. Now, with over 80% of the 2015 budget allocated to recurrent expenditure this year, that's paying salaries and taking care of overheads, the government will have to resort to aggressive borrowing, both domestic and foreign, to fund critical infrastructure. Now, there's a, there are indications that there could even be a supplementary budget. But economists tell us that now could be a good time to head to the international market to issue another eurobond. Nigeria's last eurobond has returned over 7% so far this year, outperforming its peers in emerging markets. So this may be a good way to source revenue uh, by the incoming government. Now, Esther, when Africa's richest man announces an increase of 10.5% in quarterly profits, for Dangote Cement, that's what I'm talking about. Well, for Dangote Cement, it's all about expansion, and uh, 2015 could be an excellent uh, year for the company. We've seen uh, expansive uh, investments by the company, expanding, currently expanding 
to in about 16 African countries that's outside of Nigeria. Now, the importance of this expansion is even more significant now because uh, proceeds uh, or advantages of the African projects are, are expected to begin to reflect in the company's bottom line in the coming quarter. So it's definitely something investors are keeping their eye on. It's usually one of the most traded stocks on the Nigerian Stock Exchange. So it could be a good year for Dangote Cement. But of course, we wrap up with a mining story out of Ghana. Are gold mining projects in Ghana still attracting investments in hundreds of millions of dollars? I thought that oil was the new gold in the country that used to be known as the Gold Coast. Esther? Well, you're, you're right about that, Victor. It should have been oil, but Ghana requires billions of dollars of investment in that sector. But as you know, this is not the best of times for the Ghanaian economy, which has been plagued by a very weak currency, high inflation, a widening fiscal deficit, and an energy crisis. However, the mining sector could be a lifeline for the country if adequately harnessed. There's been steady growth over the last four to five years, and the industry now contributes significantly to government revenue year in, year out. Now, like you mentioned, there are now several foreign players in the industry with the likes of Anglo Gold, Ashanti, Newmont Ghana and Goldfields Ghana. Now at the end of January, the government also firmed up plans to establish a major gold refinery plant by the end of this year now, enabling Ghana to add value to about two thirds of gold produced in the country and also boost earnings from gold production. Now the proposed plant to be run on a public private partnership model is expected to refine about 100 tons of gold per annum when it begins full operations. Esther stays with us as we usher this week's trivia and we also get to hear about Bonnie and his favorite stock. Stay with Africa Business News. Well, if you feel like investing in shares, let's put Bonnie and Esther on the spot about which share they would recommend in their parts of the world. Bonnie, which share would you go with this week? Well, Victor, this time around, it will have to be in the manufacturing space, and we're talking about Carbacid Industries. They're the manufacturers of batteries, and uh, the industry has seen some quite a bit of improvement in terms of the cost of production, a lower cost of energy, looking at a share price of 20 flat, going up by just about, what, 5%. So this is a, a company that I can uh, put my money on this time around. Okay, manufacturing in East Africa. How about you, Esther, in Lagos? Well, I think I'll go with Nestle from the consumer goods space. Nestle is an industry giant, and it appears to be doing a lot more uh, better things than its competitors. It has a wide produ product range, and it's doing pretty well on the Nigerian Stock Exchange. Okay, I can hear banks saying, why have you abandoned us? In our trivia question for this week, May 20th is the national day of which West African country, I ask? The clue is that two different parts of that country had to gain independence from France and the UK. Oh, Victor, I think the answer is Cameroon. Well, that's your neighbor. You are right. The land of Manu Dibangu and Samuel Eto. Cameroon used to be made of two parts under different colonial controls. The United Nations Trust Territory of French Cameroon gained independence from France on New Year's Day 1960, whereas the British Southern Cameroon had to wait until October 1st in 1961 to gain independence from Britain. Eventually, President Amadou Ahijo abolished this federal system in favor of a unitary state which has been celebrating May 20th as its National Day since 1972. For May 20th then, it is Happy National Day to the people of Cameroon. We're back with you next week with more Africa Business News. We thank Esther Aouini out of Lagos, Bonnie Tune in Nairobi, and earlier Christine Mundo here in Johannesburg. Stay tuned to CNBC Africa. Until next week, cheers.